that's where I met this guy. You want to introduce yourself, Jamie? Sure. <laughs> no. um, I was also abuse. Um, I was actually abuse at RR.com, and my job function was actually to dish out the abuse, or at least that's what I thought it was. Um, so, so, in addition to uh, to helping uh, this guy uh, discover the issues with the, the filtering and things that we're going to talk about today, I'm going to talk a little bit about the, the tools that we developed to, uh, to help help you guys understand what's going on. So let me just share with you a little bit about the mindset of someone who works at an ISP on the front line, someone who's in the engineering team, uh, or someone who's working abuse. Uh, you really feel like you're involved in information warfare, that there's a constant arms race of you're trying to stop bad things from happening and bad things are, are occurring. And you're trying to help uh, subscribers enjoy the internet experience and they're getting compromised. Well, we have these other groups of individuals that are going after the users, trying to impact their user experience. And once you're in that mindset and you have blinders on, you start changing your idea of what the internet is and you start losing sight of how the internet got to be where it is and you start actually believing and, and even suggesting the fact like, oh, I think we need to do SMTP filtering. I, need, I think we need to start filtering these ports. These are bad ports only meant for, for bad purposes. So we're the ones that need to do this for the good of the internet because no one else knows anything. When you work at an ISP, you assume everyone else uh, are, are a bunch of idiots, they know nothing, uh, let the adults handle this, we're going to run the network and we're going to decide for you what your best internet experience is. And that's kind of the mindset that you developed uh, w that you develop while you're working at these companies. And it's not that the, y y you look at the IETF who's supposed to be uh, directing these policies and how the internet is built, and you just kind of sit back and you think, these silly guys, they're just academics. They know nothing. You know, let the adults handle this network stuff. Trust me, we'll get a good product out to you. And you really, you really believe that you're more in control of, of where the internet should go, and you do take on the persona of, I'm doing this for the good of others. So I'm going to give a little bit of uh, history of spam, and it's, it's important because I'm going to lead up to uh, where we've been, different <coughs> network management practices that we've uh, gum, become accustomed to, uh, talk about the, our current mess that we're in, and then maybe propose some ideas or some thoughts on how we can either get out of this, or maybe it's not a problem at all. We'll, we'll let everyone uh, decide on their own. So the way that uh, this abuse game first started was open mail relays. People didn't have uh, their mail relays secured. Um, that started getting fixed. There was pressure put on companies to lock down their mail relays. Uh, then it escalated to throw, up, th throw away dial-up accounts. You sign up a dial-up account, you spam, you spam, you spam. ISPs locked down their dial-up accounts, and what spammers did, they involved. A technical measure was imposed on them. They couldn't use these mail relays. And what they figured out is they can pit other ISPs against each other. So if you have Earthlink, chances are they rented their pops at that time from UUNet, from Sprint, from PSI. Same with MindSpring, same with AOL. And spammers figured out, they adapted to the technological blocks that were in place, that if I go get a MindSpring account, which gives me a UUNet pop, that UUNet pop will be allowed to send mail through an Earthlink uh, mail relay. And that will make my account last two days instead of one day. Uh, so the arms race continues, and any, ch any, any, uh, any pl checks that we put in place, people would figure out a way to get around it or to do something else. Um, this became a problem, and uh, there's different players involved in suggesting how to fix the Internet. There's small players like Nanog, uh, news.admin.net.abuse.email, and we had some other people like Vixies, RBL, Real-Time Black Hole List, and Orbs. Uh, they're the most vocal as far as being on the internet, shouting at ISP, saying, we know the correct solution. You guys just have no idea what you're doing. We're going to fix this problem for you. Um, they, they think that they have a lot of say, but the real players are the large tier one ISPs, and they get together. And a lot of that happened here in Northern Virginia in Fairfax. Um, every abuse person knows another abuse person at another ISP by first name. Uh, they have them on speed dial. They say, what are you doing about this problem? They, are, they do work together, and they do try to figure out ways to deal with this. Uh, so one of the major uh, uh, companies behind this that said, you know, we can solve this problem. We can have port 25 filtering, and we can force people uh, on dial-up networks to only go to mail relays that 
uh, that were set up for them to be, uh, to be used. And ISPs got together, and up until this point, there were no filtering. They didn't have tools to do this. Um, and we all decided that's a great idea. We're going to make everyone go to our mail servers only. And at this point, the only people that were really complaining about that were more of the privacy advocates. They didn't necessarily feel like they should have their mail communications forced through another gateway. If they wanted to use another mail server because they were concerned about privacy, they were allowed to do that. Uh, so those were the only small complaints at that time. So we all gave each other high fives. One for the good guys. We got port 25 filtering. <coughs> what else can we filter? So at, up until this point, filtering was a, a technical problem. The notion of putting ACLs on routers and different gateways, um, that scared ISPs. At that point, line speed filtering that didn't impact uh, the CPU of the routers wasn't something that was there. Um, no one had worked together, engineering teams, multiple ISPs, to get this done. But at, uh, when that happened, when that first port 25 filter went in place, now the process is solidified. Now we do have a process. We have filter lists that we can use, and we promise we're not going to do anything bad with this. We're only doing this to curb spam, and a lot of people rallied around that and said, thank you for helping us out with the spam problem. Uh, but what came out of that was a new tool at the ISP's disposal. They now have a method to do port filtering on an entire subscriber base. So, with that, well, what's next? Well, there's obviously more things that are bad on the Internet than just mail and abuse. And I can remember when Code Red hit in 2001. It was an IIS problem at the time. But what we knew from working the abuse desks is the major seeders, the ones that were compromising all the IIS servers, was a lot of uh, Solaris uh, operating systems. Those were getting compromised over sadmin D or some other RPC service. Uh, first they would hit uh, TCP port 111, and then these Solaris machines would be infected, and then they would start the whole IIS uh, code red worm. And this got national attention. This was one of those worms that you know, my dad was talking about or calling me about because he saw it on the news. And when you have this hysteria about, you know, the Internet's collapsing, the sky is falling, it's easy to slip in one of these. So what was the solution there? Well, we'll block Sun RPC. We'll get that out for the good of the Internet. We're going to block Sun RPC. Not to, not to mention what that might impact, uh, but everyone, uh, like on these Nanog lists and other lists that were pressuring ISPs saying, you guys know nothing. You need to protect the Internet. And they were almost demanding it. The users and security experts were demanding that the ISPs don't step in and solve this problem that they created. So port 111 came. But it didn't stop there. Uh, NetBIOS, a few other things started uh, being filtered. In the beginning, in early Windows operating systems, you couldn't do a whole lot with NetBIOS abuse. But as that operating system matured, NT40, 2000, you could start getting more access into these systems. And NetBIOS was used uh, to compromise systems and turn them into ban uh, uh, bots and other spam nets. Uh, not to mention, a lot of ISPs had the problem, especially cable modems, which are bridged Ethernet devices, of clicking on network neighborhood and seeing your entire network. So that was something that uh, was instituted, uh, filtering that. SQL Slammer came about. We got this new tool for the good of the Internet. We're going to block uh, TCP 1433 and UDP uh, 1434. So this is the trend that we have. We have a steroid. We have a worm. Um, we demand help, and more filters come out of it. Right. So in addition to that, at this time is when uh, abuse desks, desks were really tasked. I mean, all these worms were spreading. There was an influx of port scanning. So what these what these providers were thinking was, you know, we're, our our call desks, our abuse desks are getting hammered at this point. What can we do? Um, our subscribers are complaining. We need to be able to do something here. We're losing a lot of money. So this is this is the the beginning of the solution, the port filtering. That was the initial solution to to mitigate some of the problems with the with the the influx of abuse. That, that's a good point. It's not because we cared about protecting the Internet. We were tired of subpoenas. We were tired of DMC takedowns. We were tired of having 100,000 emails in our box because some Joe Schmo has PC Anywhere installed or he has a printer that goes out to his entire neighborhood on SNMP looking for other printers. And when that happens, UDP packets to your entire subnet. 
all of your other neighbors that are running Black Ice Defender or Zone Alarm say, oh no, I'm getting a probe on UDP 161, or oh no, someone's trying to access me on PC anywhere. I'm going to complain to the ISP. The complaints go up. Uh, Black Ice had this feature called intelligence gathering. So when it got a probe, what it would do is it would do an NBT stat minus A against the person uh, that gave them the probe. That was a UDP connection to port 137. But if that guy was running Black Ice, he would say, hey, I'm getting probed. I'm going to go gather intelligence on this guy. And it was programs like that that, uh, that didn't capture date and timestamps that would flood our, our email boxes that were absolutely worthless to us. We wrote proc mail filters that basically said if someone's sending us a black ice uh, com complaint directly to DevNil because they're garbage. They had nothing that we needed to actually uh, investigate that incident. So another question that came to our minds as far as when we were developing this presentation is what else is, is being filtered out there? And what is the internet? I mean, we got TCP and, and UDP up here, but we haven't talked about the multiple types of ICDP or the other protocols that are the internet that people may or may not be using. And that, that question of what is the internet is definitely changing every day. So in order to figure out is this really a problem, we started doing some manual checks with friends and colleagues um, to just get a first round of data. We wanted to see, hey, is this just localized to my, my internet provider at the time, which was uh, Cox Cable? Um, so we worked with some people that we knew had a clean internet line, um, like Speakeasy. We knew that they didn't have any filters. And we started doing these tests, full uh, scans outbound with a, a packet listener on the other, net, other side and full scans inbound. And from that, what we were able to do is after we sampled about 10 or 15 ISPs, we were able to get together the common lists of not only inbound port filters, uh, but outbound. ISPs are blocking outbound connections too. So that's certainly not for your protection if they're blocking you going outbound, is it? All right. Yeah. All right, so as part of this, uh, the data collection, I'm sure you're all aware EFF is, is uh, pioneering a lot of this with uh, the recent Comcast debate. Uh, but we, initially when we started doing our research, as Aaron mentioned, you know, this was a limited subset. Uh, it was tech-savvy friends that we could utilize to provide us the data in a PCAP format that we could actually process and, and get some valid data out of. Uh, so it was, a, it was a challenge to try to develop something that uh, we could apply to the masses to try to get other people to contribute to. Um, so what we, did, what we decided to do is we really need to trim, trim this down and make it as automated as possible. Uh, you know, we limited our subset of ports. You know, we, we knew that NetBIOS was going to be an issue, but we wanted to put that in there so we could highlight that. Uh, obviously, torrent traffic is something that's, that's, uh, that's prominent of, of being blocked by uh, major ISPs at this point. Um, so as I mentioned, we needed something that everybody could run. Uh, everybody could easily gather the data, submit it, or we could do that in an automated fashion. So let's try to do something web-based. Uh, so the egress testing was pretty easy. Um, you know, we put together some PHP code. Basically, uh, it, was, it was a script that, um, that would request a one-by-one one GIF um, that was related to a port. So we could pick that up on the fly. You could do this. Uh, you know, an analogy could be you could set up a patch and listen on every single port, and if you got a 200 OK, then you know that that user got that particular um, that particular port outbound. Um, so during this process, um, you know, we we put together, like I said, we put together some code. We were having some fun with it, um, and, and you know, Aaron thought of a great idea. Would, would that would be you know, let's try to get some calls, crank calls here together to, to talk to tech to su support and say, hey, you know, we're either residential or we're business and we're trying to get to this website that's crucial to my business. Uh, so we set up this port 139 online, colon 139, and obviously, um, as you'll see uh, later, or if you don't already know that, you know, this is a NetBIOS port that obviously is going to be blocked in down now, but you may have anything to add to that. Interesting about port 139. So. I set that up and I started telling the logs. I'm like, who's, who's going to come to this? And I saw Google hit me on port 139. I kind of snickered to myself because some IDS screen just lit up because some packet went outbound 
uh, to port 139 to our server. And uh, Yahoo eventually hit it and a few others uh, started hitting it. Uh, but I had a lot of fun with Cox uh, telling them that my internet was down because I can't get to this website. And uh, incidentally, they offered to reduce my bill by $45 a month uh, because of this problem. So feel free to use that. <laughs> That, that was actually a more than a lot of fun experience. We were trying to use the, the Windows XP recorder. We realized it only would record 30 seconds of your conversation. So we're, you know, we we're dropping F-bombs and we're like, I can't believe we missed that. That was the best part. So uh, Aaron kept re-asking the same questions. You know, can you get to this IP address? Because I really need to get to this. Uh, so regard anyway, that, it was a pretty funny experience. Um, so this, this is a little bit of uh, intro of uh, portscan.us. Um, the domain name we've had for quite some time, we actually decided to put something together and use it. Um, so as Aaron mentioned, initially uh, when we submitted our abstract, we started doing this gathering of this data pretty manually. And this is the would be the initial landing page that you would come to uh, when you come to the site. And we try to do a lot of this stuff on the back end with PHP, obviously, and, and giving your IP uh, for those users that are not as tech savvy as people in this room. Um, a couple other things that we, we were trying to collect are you know, obviously your ISP, we can do that with some reverse lookups. Um, the class of service that you have, which is pretty important, um, because as we discovered with some of these crank calls is, you know, Aaron's paying $120 a month for a business class line, however, he's not getting unrestricted access, which he, you know, during his conversations with him, he assumed he was getting. If I refresh that page, does it correct the spelling? Uh, it might. <laughs> We're tech guys. We don't have to spell, do we? <laughs> uh, did I get all of that? Yeah. Okay. And and some of the we got some pretty interesting comments. Um, people that submitted. Uh, some of them loved their ISP. Some of them were shocked that uh, you know they were blocking certain ports. Um, <coughs> Am I not loud enough? That's for the camera. Oh, okay. Just hold it. Okay. So this is the display of the egress testing. Um, obviously, we want to do a limited subset of the ports. Um, but what was interesting of that we discovered during this testing was that um, by default, Firefox in 2001 started uh, blocking a lot of these ports due to a cross-protocol exploit. Um, IE blocked uh, 25 by default. So in order to get the user to, uh, to get valid data with this, uh, we either had to ask um, you know, our security conscious people that were doing the testing to add a, a port band override to their about config in Firefox or to utilize another browser. And it turns out port 25 is blocked all across all the bro uh, browsers, Opera, uh, Safari, Firefox, and Internet Explorer 6. So. So the more difficult part of this was was the inbound testing. Um, you know, it's just at this point there's nothing out there that you can do this with in an autom automated fashion. Uh, you still require somebody that knows what they're doing to do a TCP dump or a wind dump and capture capture these capture these packets for you. Uh, so we tried to make this as seamless as possible. Uh, you know, we set up something for them to copy the, the command lines to the clipboard. Um, and, and to launch the, the scan for them. Uh, this part of the testing, the data is pretty incomplete. Um, the majority of the people on, out there on the internet are not on the quote unquote raw internet. They typically have a device that's in front of them doing uh, firewalling or, or natting. Um, so we really relied on people in the security community to uh, you know, get on the internet there and be able to jump on their Unix box and, and dump some packets for us. I'm done with that slide. <laughs> so to the results, um, a big UG here. Um, somewhat inconclusive for the ingress testing. Uh, pretty decent data set for the egress testing. Um, what was consistent across the board was, uh, was the NetBIOS um, that's blocked pretty much by every ma major ISP. Um, what was surprising to us, though, was that uh, port 21 was filtered through the browser. Um, now, that's a pretty prominent service out there. 
Uh, one of our friends, and a security consultant that we worked with, said to this, to this day he still util utilizes uh, FTP to transfer data. Um, maybe I'm calling him out because he's still using uh, FTP and not SFTP or something. But um, the other thing that, that we noticed that changed was the the port the filtered ports changed. Um, this really stumped us. When we initially started doing the packet captures, when we were actually using things like HPing and NMAP to send and capture this, this traffic, um, you know, we were getting pretty consistent data. Um, two, three months later, when we started develop, when we, as, the, as we were progressing through developing this web application, we noticed things changed. Uh, you know, what's causing this? Is it the networks being satura saturated? Uh, is it something with my GHGP leases? Uh, we weren't sure. Um, so we couldn't really categorize um, by, by region or provider. What we discovered was, um, much as the case when we worked at these, these ISPs, there was always a, a cowboy in the engineering group or, a, a, you know, I myself was one of these security guys um, when I worked for uh, Roadrunner Time Warner that said, let's put this port filtering in, let's do, the, the, do these these filters. So, you know, I was I was uh, I was the jackass that that started a lot of this from the ISP side, and now I'm on the other side, uh, which is why we're giving this presentation. But uh, so it was, you know, this was really um, different from region to region. Like I said, different tool sets, um, and I think that's all I had to say about that. Actually. <laughs> Yeah, I think you need to be careful to generalize and say Comcast does all of this or Time Warner does all of this. And I think you need to uh, understand that most of these um, cable operating ISPs, it's a regional thing. There's a regional engineering team. And depending on the region, a lot of these companies were bought, acquired, Adelphia, you know, at home. Um, different companies went with different technology, so they don't always have the same gear. So it is difficult for them to have a consistent filtering policy across the, the national spectrum. So it will differ depending on region to region. So the, the, uh, the Internet is changing. We were surprised that ISPs are blocking outbound 21. I mean, come on now. I mean, FTP isn't that dead of a protocol. I still need to get drivers and things on it. And we were surprised... Uh, we weren't so surprised about the NetBIOS, but there were some other uh, ports that popped up. You know, we did see things like older peer-to-peer -peer applications like Emule or WinMX uh, that were being blocked. Um, and the question that comes to a lot of people's mind is, well, how can your ISP just change what they constitute service any time that they want? Well, something that we engineered in the early days was the Internet Access Agreement. And if you read an Internet Access Agreement, somewhere in this Internet Access Agreement, it says, by merely using our service, you agree to the terms inside of the Internet Access Agreement. Sorry. So by using our service, you agree to the terms inside of the Internet Access Agreement, and we may notify you of changes to this Internet Access Agreement at any time just by updating our website. We may elect to email you, uh, we may mail you a letter, but we can do it uh, based on what the website says. Oh, and by the way, by using the Internet, and you, you do agree to our Internet Access Agreement, which also says you agree to our acceptable usage policy, which, by the way, we can also make changes to at any given time simply by updating the website. So ISPs can and do change the Internet at any time that they want simply by updating that agreement, and by you using their service, you now agree to that, to that new agreement. So that's how it's done. And I, I brought this little quote out of the uh, Comcast policy because they're the ones receiving the most pressure about this this week. And people were asking the question, well, how, how do you just change the policy on us? And how do you uh, communicate that policy? And this was uh, their response to that. Um, so... What is an Internet service provider, and what do you expect from your ISP? That's, that's really a, a good question, and I don't necessarily have the answer to that. Do they only get you on the network, and then, and then it's up to you what you do? Um, uh, does their service need to include protection? I can remember a time when we first started this where we were definitely afraid of offering any filtering or anti-spam or pop-up blockups, because in our mind if we were to 
uh, offer port filtering in the interest of security, like filtering BIOS, then we were providing you a security service. And if our security service failed, then we would be liable for that failure of the service. So that's something that went amongst our small round tables as far as, oh, do we really want to go down this path of filtering internet because we'll be liable if this uh, protection service no, no longer works. Um, so the internet can change uh, and it does. Uh, where did Usenet go? Right? A lot of time, it's still there, but a lot of ISPs don't offer access as part of their service offering to Usenet. All right. So we have this changing internet. Uh, ports are being filtered, and no one's really upset about this at this point. It's the battery. All right. Hello. So no one's really that upset about the fact that the, uh, the internet is changing. There, there's a few people that are upset, privacy advocates, um, some internet purists that don't like it when these commercial companies just change the internet on them. Uh, spammers obviously need to adapt. Uh, there's a few security testers that don't like these uh, fil port filtering because they can't test their customers because they can't get a clean ISP to figure out if their clients are vulnerable. Um, and I have to look back at this whole thing and wonder what did we really accomplish in that, er, in that early time when we started filtering port 25 and how could things have played out differently if we just butted out. Um, email, never, we never really let it get to that state where it was completely broken and useless. And if we didn't just quit applying these small little band-aids, who knows, we might have all worked together and decided to change this protocol uh, altogether. Instead, what happened is a lot of our mail activity moved to the web to services like Gmail. So we don't really know the, uh, if the impact that we had when we started filtering the internet then. Uh, the fact of the matter and the problem that we're up against now is the internet is cha cha changing faster than the oversubscription model for selling bandwidth uh, to consumers. Um, the internet in the early days used to be more of a one-way communication med or a two-way communication medium. I have some research data. I want to share it with another scientist. We trade it back and forth. Uh, but as more people started getting connections, it became more one way. We had all these dial-up users and other broadband people. We have content providers and content networks that feed it to us. So that really lends itself well to making your downstream the most important thing uh, to you because you're trying to get that content. You're not necessarily trying to publish content from your location to other people. Um, and another problem that we have right now is users still don't really want all of their website media content in their current package. That was true, we would all just go to ISIS, and we would all just go to the content providers who were giving it to us one way. Uh, for some reason, we're not happy with how multimedia is, is uh, packaged, and we're coming up with other ways, like peer to peer networks, to share that. So, the tipping point. You're okay with filtering the internet for the most part, but, but something changed. Something changed in October of 2007 for the first uh, report of forged reset packets to throttle BitTorrent. Uh, was released. Thank you. Um, we really don't know when this first happened. Smaller players could have been doing it long before that, uh, but this is where it started really getting some attention and a lot of attention about this. And we're going to talk more about what happened here and some things that are going on in that space. So, couldn't uh, give this presentation without putting this company's name uh, on the board there. I encourage everyone, uh, if you haven't already, to go to the website and, and really read this paper. This is a, a piece that they've created about um, basically how everyone on the internet is greedy and they're trying to take uh, their fair share. And the only way to you know, restore fairness to the internet is if we have something like this. So please, please read this um, and, and put your tinfoil hat on when you read this and really read into what they're saying here. Um, I know this is a security conference, so let's please be kind to this company. Uh, that is a classic .asp file, and it is taking in a parameter 
So we don't know what could happen, so let's just stick to that URL right there. <laughs> All right. So this company was acquired by Sandvine not too long ago. And what I like to do is we all know that Sandvine's being used somewhere, right, on some ISPs. Um, and we, they, we know that they acquired this. So if Sandvine is a tool that's on our networks and these are the other capabilities, right now their sales engineers are trying to sell this other stuff because that box is already there. So let's, let's look at the two products that uh, uh, Simplicta had before they were acquired. One was log aggregation and heuristic analysis of disparate data. I mean, what, is, what does that mean? Well, the idea was we can take logs from all of these different places and we can identify threats. And based on those threats, uh, we can do things to, to mitigate those threats to protect our networks. Uh, maybe what you could do with something like this would be to figure out, oh, all my VoIP traffic, 80% of it is Skype. That could be a problem. So th there's other things that you can do with this, uh, this analysis of heuristic log data that you bring in and, and normalize. Um, another interesting thing that uh, was one of their products was controlling internet services with DNS traffic switch, a technique to fight phishing attacks and clean zombies. Thank you. Please protect us from, from these fishers. Uh, so that's interesting. Uh, internet services controlled with DNS traffic. Well, how would this product work if someone didn't use the ISP's DNS server? It wouldn't work. So we can't have that. That means we're going to force you to use our DNS server because we need this to work. And if you're doing something bad or naughty on the internet, we're going to redirect you to a timeout and say, quit downloading all those torrent files. You're messing it up for your neighbors. So that's something else that it could, one of their products can do. So who's using this? Well, if you go to the website, you can look at a list of all the proud customers that are currently using this technology at their ISP. No, that, that list doesn't exist. Uh, but if this tool is really to restore fairness to the Internet so everyone can enjoy it equally, why isn't there a list of all the proud users? Why isn't your ISP saying, yeah, we're using Sandvine because we're helping you out so you can enjoy the Internet? Because Jamie over here likes to leave his torrents on all night long. We're not hiding anything. <laughs> so, so there is a question of um, who is using this. Now... Combined, we've both worked at ISPs for, for nearly eight years. It's a small community, especially on the national level. Um, we have friends at all of these companies that are in, in the engineering departments, so we know who's using this. Um, when uh, some of our friends, since we've broken out of that crowd and we do our own things, now we're fighting the good fight, um, that we approached about just to have a beer and talk with us a little bit about this. Uh, we had one of our friends just really clam up and, and uh, basically got really defensive and won't speak to us. Um, on the other hand, when some of our friends saw this title, this presentation, they started coming out of the woodwork, like deep throat, saying, you wouldn't believe what's going on, and, and telling us all this information. We're like, whoa, okay, slow down there. Um, so we're just going to play an imagine if game as far as who might be customers here. So, an ISP whose business model is, is built on the oversubscription of the one-way internet. So, an ISP that could be impacted by one user in a location saturating all the up, up, uh, up, upload bandwidth. An ISP that didn't plan or couldn't plan for how the internet is changing, how there is more of a demand for multimedia. An ISP who's not a tier one and pays big bucks for strategic peering and bandwidth. So, these smaller players, when it hits those tier one backbones, they're paying for that. And the upload, uh, the upload is, is, is a lot more expensive than the download, which is why the oversubscription models uh, work partly to the way that they do. So let's imagine who probably isn't a Sandvine customer right now. In the midst of this, during that whole uh, thing with the resetting bit torrents and, and oh, I can't believe our ISPs are, are, are doing this, and some certain ISPs saying, well, it's a certain small percentage of evil user, internet users who are screwing that up because upload is a precious bandwidth. In the midst of that, Verizon comes out and says, have 20 megs up. We don't care. Have 20 megs out. If you want to do it, go for it. And we were thinking about that. We're like, huh, why, why would they do that? There could be, uh, there could be a few reasons. My personal opinion is, is it really is a statement of, yeah, that's how good our network is. And if we get more of our users using peer-to-peer -peer technologies and uploading 
uh, more, it's really going to have the biggest impact on competitors who can't compete the same way that someone like this can compete. So that was an interesting thing that came out during the middle of all this. They upped their upload speed. All right, so a lot of people are upset about this, and it's hard to get sympathy uh, when everyone knows that you're downloading copyrighted materials or something like that, that you're downloading movies and things. You know, there's, a, there's a few people out there that are complaining about they can't uh, download Ubuntu or whatever it is, um, but the fact of the matter is a lot of people are definitely upset about this issue. Um, there's one website that we follow, nnsquad.org, networkneutrality.org, and we've been following a lot of the, uh, the incidents that are being reported. And one of the themes that we noticed is users don't know what's happening. They know something's wrong, something doesn't feel right, um, and this is the types of reports that they, that, that, they, that they throw out there. My streaming got interrupted. It must be my ISP doing something evil. My SSH telnet windows keep dying. It must be my ISP doing something evil. My RC connections keep dropping, um, that sort of thing. And what people need to realize is there are other problems besides just ISPs tampering with that data that are causing these issues. Could be something just the fact that the, there's some, some packet loss. Maybe your ISP doesn't have the cleanest connection. Could be DNS timeouts, could be short DHCP leases, could be just the fact that you have a slow computer. But overwhelmingly what we see from that website is people don't have the tools or the expertise to really prove anything is really happening to them. And that's where a community like us could help out as far as, hey, we're smart, we can program things on the network layer. We can get tools to the masses to help them actually get some good uh, data to investigate this, to get the word out. So actual verified reports of this filtering, it went from this, ah, they're doing something to us, to, okay, if they're doing something to us, where is the proof? And then, you know, a few days trickled by and someone was able to capture it. Someone was able to get those unsolicited reset uh, in a packet capture for everyone to see. And if you want to check them out yourself, uh, go to uh, the EFS website, and there's a very uh, excellent article about how, the, how it all works. So if this is a big problem, and if a, a, most major cable ISPs are, are doing something like this, um, why aren't there thousands of reports? So here's a spokesperson for the Cellular Telecommunications and Internet Association Act, and he says, uh, no evidence of any widespread implementation of preferred network management, by the way, that's the buzzword, network management, um, is evident. If it became a common practice for the other side of the debate would have a credible argument. So essentially, we don't have a credible <laughs> argument. This is being blown out of proportion by people because it's really not happening. It is not widespread. Um, I mean, we, we know the contrary here. So the, is, is it a real problem? The truth that everyone needs to know is this isn't always on. This isn't a, a on-again, off-again product. Um, this has a policy that's defined by the carrier, by the ISP, and you have to meet the threshold of that policy before this happens. So it is even, it's difficult for even tech-savvy people to catch their ISP in the act to doing this. You would have to coordinate with a bunch of friends that are on the same local uh, cable card or whatever it is that you're connected to, um, to, 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 to see if, if you can exceed the number of seeds. So in that policy, you can define the number of active seeds that, that you're allowed. A typical policy for a lot of these ISPs is 50. And if that number exceeds, then that's when those reset packets start happening. So it is a, a challenge to see. So now we have um, the FCC demanding from some major ISPs what their network management practices are. And if this is a policy that can be configured and you're getting a lot of heat right now, maybe we should turn this crap off or <laughs> let's turn this thing on you know, or, or change the policy uh, to, until this issue blows over and then we'll start it up again. So be aware of that. It's not, it's not necessarily always on even though it is wi widely deployed. <coughs> All right, so why did this particular issue get so much attention as far as the reset packets uh, happening? Do you guys remember when VeriSign started resolving all of the .com addresses and the, the, the reaction that they got from that? Uh, their first, uh, their first uh, response was, well, we own these name servers. We're allowed to do that. We're not doing anything bad. We're just showing people that they can register domains with us. But we didn't like that. We, as the Internet community, didn't like that. Uh, because in our minds, that crossed the line. We had a service that we relied on that we expected to operate in a certain manner 
And one day that service changed, and no one was going to tell us about it. It just happened. So a lot of, for a lot of people, this dot-com thing was a trust issue. We had trust that this utility, and I like to call ISPs an internet utility provider, not an internet service provider, that this utility changed right, right out from under us, and, uh, and we don't like change. It, because that started getting us thinking about, huh, well, what's next to come as far as if they're brazen enough to send reset packets in between my communication, what, am I, what is else to come? And that's uh, why people are, are definitely worried about um, now this tool is in place, we can use this tool to do other things, to favor other internet traffic over others, which is really spawning this debate. So will this even matter? Um, we still have email. It works. It, it, it evolved. And if you talk to friends and family, this is an election year. The percentage of people who actually really care about this is, is quite small. Um, as long as they can get to the web, they're, they're okay with that. Um, which, which is a problem because, first of all, they're unaware of the service can, is changing on them. And the service, the way that it is changing, they may not use it anyway. Um, here's a report that 37% of all internet traffic is uh, peer-to-peer. Is -peer. Um, now, let me let you know that the source of this graph is someone who's in the network management business. So I get apathy from my fellow techies when I start talking about this is a problem. This is a problem. We can't just have the, our, our internet utility changed on us at a, at a whim because it's inconveniencing a business model because board of directors are upset about profit margins. Um, and this is what I get all the time. Shouldn't these companies be allowed to operate their networks any way they want? After all, you signed the user agreement or you agreed to the user agreement. There is some validity there. Um, I don't, I don't accept the fact that the user agreement can change on me at any given time. I, I think that's bullshit. Another thing is, this utility that we have, the internet, it's not that because these companies just are, are providing it to us and they're privately owned. No, they work with our state, our local, our city governments. They get easements. They get land rights utes. We allow them to build this network for this, so this utility can exist so we can use it. So I, I don't agree to that as far as um, they're a private company and they should be able to do what they want. Um, another thing I hear is just change your ISP. Well, if all of them are doing this, that's a problem. And that really isn't a, a solution for a lot of people who might be stuck in a region who just can't uh, pack up and move. And then I hear this from, from, from some friends from time to time. We're doing it for the good of the Internet. Some people actually still believe that there are some people out there that are doing this for the good of the Internet, and it's not about money. It's not about reducing spam complaints. It's not about reducing uh, the number of subpoenas, trap and trace orders uh, that come across uh, abuse desks. This is about alleviating that workload and, and getting the profits up. So what's happening now in this? Well, the FCC is pressuring ISPs for more open network management practices. This is good. They're going to ISPs and they're wanting people to disclose. Uh, petitions, complaints, lawsuits are being filed. There is a new, uh, uh, there's a new act that's, that's, being, uh, that's been out there that just was introduced this week, the Internet Freedom Preservation Act. I encourage you guys to check that out. That's talking a little bit more about that role that an ISP plays and what they can do with our traffic and what they can't. Uh, where is this going to go? More lawsuits. Uh, a question you got to ask yourself, is it really a good idea to have the federal government involved here? Um, what could that also do to the Internet? Um, maybe just applications will e evolve. If you want Usenet and you go to Giga News to get an account, they, you can get Usenet over SSL. Well, why are they doing that? Because some of my ISPs are filtering that Usenet traffic. And if you tunnel or encapsulate it in SSL, you get around those filters. This is a cat and mouse game. Um, as, as we speak, a slash, dot, a slash dot headline today is that BitTorrent clients are being improved uh, with encryption keys and things to, to thwart this latest, um, this, this latest movement here. And what's eventually going to happen, because we have history, we saw what happened with spammers, is eventually a user is going to be sued or they're going to go to jail for this. Um, and it's going to be some lawsuit brought by a cable company that says, Joe User was circumventing filtering technology and causing a network uh, dis service disrupt disruption for my entire region. And uh, somehow they're going to get a lawyer to equate that with cracking. And some dumbass judge is going to believe that circumventing this filtering technology is cracking and someone will go to jail. That's, that's one way that this might happen. Um, <laughs> Be 
Yeah, or we'll just put it in the terms of service. You can't do this anymore. Look at the IP multimedia subsystem. And essentially, you've got the way VoIP works today. Um, they could implement the system, and they have to, because they'll be doing the voice over IP, and they'll be doing the um, video streaming. They'll have to have filters in line that will open ports to allow that traffic through. So then they can just put that control on everything. And you don't go to a website unless you tell their server you want to go to a website and it approves that as part of your policy. Absolutely. They can just put it in the terms of service that you can't even use these technologies anymore. Or if you do, you have to subscribe to installing this application on your computer or whatever it is. I mean, we don't know what it will really evolve to right now. Uh, so we've let things, things slide in the past. Our internet's changed on us. We haven't really uh, complained that much. Uh, this particular issue is something that we're re-energized about. Oh my God, they're sending these reset packets. So we have another chance here to maybe uh, get something done about it. What we want to happen is more disclosure or full disclosure of any network management practices and a better notification process if your internet utility provider decides to change the service on you. Uh, we want be be people to be better informed of what their ISP is doing and what these, these practices are because you need that information before you commit to service. Because if someone does have a choice right now and they are concerned about this, they need to have real information about this is what my ISP filters, this is what my ISP blocks. Hmm, maybe I want a Fios connection instead. So, questions and answers. Some sites worth visiting. It'll, where, the question was, where does IPv6 fit into the cat and mouse game? Um, someone will figure out that, hey, I can use IPv6 to get around these filters for a little bit. It'll work for a while, and then it'll be blocked or stopped. We use the term uh, utility, for my, and I agree with I think of them as a utility. Right. Do you think that it will move to that, that they will be formally declared utility, opening up the government regulation, the state regulation, like they do for other utilities. Why do you think they're a utility? Is it because they're subsidized and they own, they can go on I your property under your easement? Because and of the nature of, like, um, electricity, gas. Right. We expect that stuff to be on. We expect electricity right. to work the same way. I think of them as a necessity. I need the electricity. I need the telephone. There's a lot of money being made off of this service. Um, but every other utility is a pay as you go. That's another thing. You don't have unlimited electricity. You don't have unlimited telephone unless you pay extra for it. You don't have unlimited gas. Excellent point. We may be paying for other classes of service. Uh, we may move to a model where you pay per byte. Question in the back. There are we experimenting with that uh, as far as bandwidth on band? Absolutely. I mean, the United States is a little different, but there's a lot of other countries around the world that already do that. Yeah, they, they talked about tiered services for a long time for gaming communities. Um, the problem now is that they can actually, you know, now they can actually force this on you. Whereas uh, in the past it was just, you know, we'll charge you for it, but you're still not guaranteed that. And Sorry, that way, Mark. Question. One, one observation as an opener, um, talking about bogus complaints from black guys, we get those as well because we have time dot, dot, uh, Right. <laughs> Okay, good. Um, Question. Um, one of the things you were talking about is the best data to different ISPs. Have you found any that are better than other ones? Yeah. Um, speakeasy, no filters there. Um, well, you pay for that, though. Exactly. Um, <laughs> It's crazy to me that some ISPs filter outbound. Um, uh, residential files does not. They do block port 80 inbound. Um, um, and another thing that was surprising to us is the, this notion of we'll just get a business account with static. There's still a lot of blocks on those business accounts. They're not always freely available. Question in the back, Green Hat. How does, how does capping right. play into this? What's the question? How you discuss capping? How, how, would, how would capping play into these policies and everything else like, um, as far as how an ISP determines it? Well, 
I guess because that oversubscription equation is wrong, they need to really look at, well, we can't, we can't build a solution where if one guy uses all two megs of an upstream, it takes out an entire neighborhood. Now, you can try to fight that all you want with these new technologies, but that really is the problem. There isn't enough upload speed. So you got one business entity that needs to protect that to make it as usable as possible, or another one can remove those caps. Come on in. We built a network to handle this. There's some pretty interesting articles about there, out there that does a cost comparison of uh, doing traffic shaping with these network management tools versus building out your network. You should check out. Green hat. Did you, did you, you said uh, 21 is it block that kind of well? Imagine that. So, I mean, I consider FTP as an internet service, and right, people just can't get to it anymore. I don't know. <laughs> Maybe some abuse guy found some worm where bots were updating themselves over an FTP site and decided to block port 21. But, you know, Maybe someone was running a wear server on their own local dynamic IP and they figured, ah, let's just block it inbound and outbound and make, make this problem go away. Before torrents, there was FTP sites, right? right. And, you know, maybe the, the thought is it's a clear text protocol, even though the same company is probably still run Telnet. I'm going to try to get some questions. I, I don't mean to ignore the side of the room. It's just that light is blinding me. In, in the front row? Yeah, just an observation. You mentioned, I, I take it the bear side you're talking about was the site finder, the DNS uh, stuff. Was that called site finder? Site when they? Finder when they were redirecting all the misspelled.com? Right. Yeah, that's right, that's right, yep. Um, just an observation, I think Verizon's actually doing that right now. If you're a customer there... They are, and they're using their DNS servers, yeah. Dell, buy the Dell Yep, you go to their portal. Yeah. Question, Black Shirt? Right, so there could be a censorship issue there as far, especially, I mean, I could see, I could see us responding to this by tunneling everything over SSL. Hmm, we can't have that. We're going to make sure that all of our, our customers now have our SSL certs, and we're going to be SSL man in the middle them so we can do network management, so we can have this glorious internet that everyone gets their fair share of. Definitely have all right, thanks guys. Check it out, guys. So thank you, Aaron and Jamie. They're going to be stepping outside. If you have more uh, questions for them, right outside the hall for Force Internet Condom. You, Next up really is aware of any tools Mark Hardy with a HackerLark's Past 50. Like your normal average user could use to, 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 to see.